views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to OpenBXRX, BronxNet special coverage providing you the latest information that matters to you during COVID-19, the coronavirus, and now through social justice actions and civil unrest taking place nationally and here in the Bronx. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and today is Tuesday, July 28th. Coming up, we'll discuss the recent spike in gun violence here in the Bronx and how Bronx Rises Against Gun Violence, aka BRAG, is working on the ground to promote safer streets. Then, BX Arts Factory shares more about their Creative Corner virtual series, how COVID-19 has affected their artists and volunteers, and more. After that, we'll learn about the Schomburg Center's Black Liberation Reading List, educational online resources on Black culture, and more. And author S.J. Brown joins us to discuss their debut book, The Black Professional's Guide, How to Navigate White Privilege in the Workplace. So please, stay tuned. Open BXRX starts now. Welcome to Open BXRX on BronxNet. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, inviting you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. Gun violence has claimed the lives of several young men and women of color in the Bronx and across the city. Now, through these times of civil unrest and anti-police brutality movements, our community must also focus on dismantling violence in our own streets. Bronx Rises Against Gun Violence, AKA BRAG, has been doing this work through community-led efforts. Joining us now to discuss is David Gaba, Senior Program Director at BRAG. David, thank you so much for making the time to speak to us about this important topic. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Just for those who are not familiar, can you give us a little bit about BRAG and your mission? How has um, youth, how, how many youth has BRAG helped throughout its time? So, uh, as you said, BRAG stand, uh, stands for Bronx Rides Against Gun Violence. It is a program of Good Shepherd Services, and we're part of the city's crisis management system. And we have served hundreds of youth since our inception in 2014. We went from one program, one care violence program, to three care violence programs in three different areas of the Bronx, the West, the North, and the Northwest. We used a public health approach to dismantle the gun violence in the most impacted areas of a particular precinct. We work in the 4-6, 4-7, and the 5-2. Gotcha. And um, David, what made you get into this field of work? Can you share more about your experience with gun violence and growing up in the Bronx? Absolutely. I'm a Bronx side, born and raised. Um, went to the, through the public school system. Uh, started a gang when I was in second grade. Uh, you could do the math on the age that I was. We're talking about maybe eight years old. Um, and it was really survival. Um, so uh, you had to have protection, you had to have a crew around you just to defend yourself. Um, what got me into this work um, was the fact that I'm a product of the Bronx, um, have lived all the consequences that happen in the streets that catch up with you and swallow you whole. And more, some, most importantly, uh, my oldest brother was shot and killed. And that had a profound impact on me, uh, watching, you know, him be put in the ground, seeing the effects on the family, as well as myself. It, this was an easy decision. Right. I'm sorry for the loss of your brother. And, you know, thank you for doing this work, even despite all the obstacles that you face in your personal life through gun violence and growing up in the Bronx. Um, I want to learn um, why it's important that Bragg is a community-led effort. So um, how can it be more effective than over-policing and the presence of NYPD to combat gun violence in order to establish that trust with youth? Can you tell us more about that? 100%. Um, so this, this model is designed, the cure violence model started in Chicago. Obviously, we all know what's happening when it comes to shootings and homicides in Chicago over the many years. 
uh, an epidemiologist, uh, Dr. Gary Slicker, started it, and it, it uses a public health approach. It, it, it treats violence like a contagion. It spreads, right? So, for example, if I were to see my older brother put in some pain, and then what comes out of that is power, prestige, you know, and profit, then guess what's going to happen? I'm going to see that. I'm going to internalize that. I, in, in, in effect, become infected, and then I start doing the same things, and guess what happens to those around me, right? So in terms of uh, the model itself, is designed to do three things. One is to mediate conflicts on the spot, and in these areas that we work in, the most impacted areas of a precinct in terms of gun violence and violence in general, um, we do hundreds, hundreds a month in, in the site. And so that's part one. Part two is to identify the high risk youth, because when you look at the data, the data basically tells you that the 14 to 25 year olds are the ones that are involved in those high risk activities that include gun violence, right? Mm -hmm. And the third one is to mobilize the community because the community has kind of looked at this violence problem as a norm. It just goes with the territory. It's how it is. For example, what happened with Junior, people are videotaping it instead of trying to help him. See, so um, we use credible messengers to deploy this model, and it has worked to a tremendous success, hence the, 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 the expansion of our programs. We also have a, a slew of other initiatives that help the youth. Right. Um, David, I also want to talk about your thoughts on the recent spike in gun violence within the Bronx and nationwide. You recently participated in a rally with Save Our Streets following the tragic shooting of 70-year-old Brandon Hendricks. Can you just tell me a little bit more about that? Right, so this is, this is a Bronx concerted effort um, of community base, and it not only includes uh, Bragg, but it also includes our other partners in the cure violence field. In the city of New York, there are three, 23 cure violence programs. In the Bronx, there are numerous. So it's not just Bragg, it's also SOS Save Our Streets, SUV Stand Up to Violence, uh, RTG released the grip. And so we partner with each other on a regular basis. They're in other precincts, in the hot zones in those precincts. So we partner, we work together. We use the same cure violence model. But in addition to that, we also have the families that are affected by gun violence. We also have, obviously, the district attorney's office. We, we also have Guns Down Life Up, which is an initiative to bring that attention, in particular, the hospitals, because that's where they take the victims in. And so during the summer, you'll see uh, marches in numerous areas. The areas that particularly suffer from this, this tremendous contagion of gun violence and violence in general. And we will be out there making sure that the, that the community stand up for themselves and that we have an impact. The community itself can have a major impact. I can give you statistics of our success and they're pretty tremendous. I would love to see those, absolutely, but I'm pretty sure they are. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to learn how Bragg has been working through COVID-19. I know you've been doing monthly events, outreach, handing out masks and all that stuff. You've been out here on the streets still helping. Absolutely. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, uh, obviously our work is done in an outreach fashion. We're in the community on a regular basis, speaking to the mothers, the grandparents, the youth, the business improvement, district owners. Um, so when the pandemic hit, we had to make sure we take precautions. So we obviously decided to get ourselves trained to understand social distance and what it means to wear a mask, wash your hands, don't touch your eyes and your nose. The city provided us with PPEs, so we're constantly distributing masks, hand sanitizers, uh, postcards that give you information on what to do and also where to find resources. Right. Oh, thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to discuss, David, um, this wasn't on our list of discussions that I sent over, but um, just about how times have kind of changed. So like back in the day, I'm not that old, but like back in the day, um, I used to be able to like rely on neighbors or almost like like neighbors had my back and had the youth's back. But a lot of times today, we kind of just like, you know, everybody's minding their business and there's not a lot of like mentorship. What is a message that you can send out to like, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, basically, and, and stop things like gun violence from happening in our communities. You're absolutely right. In that press conference that we had when I had an opportunity to speak, you know, I, I explained the message that we're in hospitals, we're in schools, you know, we, we're intrinsically involved in the neighborhood. But I also had a message out there for the little homies and the big homies, getting them to understand that uh, there was a time when it was off limits. Women and children were off limits. 
playgrounds were off limits, churches, uh, shopping districts. Uh, and that was my message. My message is because they're influencers, right? And this is where our credibility comes in. When we talk, we look like them, talk like them, walk like them, eat the same foods, live where they live. That's where we hire the staff from, from those highly impacted areas. And so they'll listen to us probably quicker than they would someone from law enforcement, right? It has been proven, okay? So um, when the time comes, they, they have to understand that, you know, in, in that particular shooting, you're putting a gun out the window of a vehicle and you're looking at the individual who's your target, but he's walking with his little girl. Right. I, I lived right around the corner from where that happened. Time members of mine went to Path High School, which is that block right there. Right. So times have changed. So now the message is, come see us. They, they all know who we are. We've been doing this for the last six years. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. We're located in the Fordham area, right between the, the two areas that we, we service, close up to King Ridge, down to 183rd, from the concourse to, for, to, to um, Jerome Avenue. And then in the North Bronx, we're up there on Bronx. So we'll be right between Edenwald and White Plains Road in 227. Like, you'll find us there. We work late at night. Come see us. Give us a call. Uh, if you have a young person that maybe is, is involved in these high-risk activities, we're ready to help them. If the family needs help, we have all measures of wraparound services from employment, education, training. We have a music recording studio because they think they're going to be the next hip-hop superstar. But we can also try to get those jobs that are behind those superstars in production and music sound. Um, we've been featured on BET. We have a lot of resources for them. So please come see us. See, I love that. It's a one-stop shop for everything, for support, mentorship, resources, everything. So thank you so much, David, for sharing more about Bragg. And I really hope that, you know, something can change in our communities and that people start to just work together to dismantle this gun violence that's ravishing our lives. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to send the message out. Appreciate your work. Anytime you need us, just give us a call. Absolutely. You have a friend in us as well. Thank you. Folks, Thank to you. learn more and support Bragg, please follow them at Bragg underscore GSS on Instagram. And you can visit goodshepherds.org slash program slash Bragg for more information. Open BXRX will be right back. They're being hailed as heroes. It makes me feel so happy that I'm able to do this and bring smiles to people's faces. Healthcare workers from Split Rock Rehab and Healthcare Center, tasked with taking care of dozens of patients diagnosed with COVID-19, had a bit of Broadway descend on their Baychester facility, thanks to 11-year-old star of Disney's Lion King, Layla Capers, who plays young Nyla in the production. She came to say thank you to workers like Michelle Williams. Right now, Split Rock is COVID-free. Over there, the residents are COVID-free, and I thank God for that. Along with around 165 workers, Williams, who is a dietary aide, took every step to ensure that she was safe as dozens of patients at the facility tested positive for COVID-19. I know not to leave the house without a mask and when we come inside here, we get our temperature taken and we usually test it two times a week and now we test, we're being tested one times a week. All this while getting updates from health officials to prevent its re-emergence. It's like fighting a war with an invisible enemy. And uh, right now, the more we know about it, the more we are able to go out there and battle it. It has been very challenging. Once separated from seeing her workers, Noreen Ray, a VP at 1199 SCIU, along with Congressman Elliot Engel, State Senator Jamal Bailey, and New York City Council Member Andy King are relieved to see infection rates citywide go down. And I'm really happy that today we were able to say to them right here that we appreciate them. Just because we flatten the curve, so to speak, doesn't mean that this fight is over. And these women and men who fight every single day for our loved ones, for the people in these residences, in these hospitals, in any, any place where people are affected by COVID-19, it's time for us to continue to respect and appreciate what they do. We still have to make sure that nursing homes are respected and protected. And the workers here in Split Rock, the members of 1199, have been on the ground since day one, since the pandemic. And how do we give pay tribute while people are still standing? Well, we got to have ceremonies and celebrations like this. Well, they stuck it out and stayed the course, and now it's all about saying thank you. Here in Baychester, Arlene Makoko for Bronx Net. Welcome back to Open BXRX. 
Through volunteer-led grassroots work, the BX Arts Factory has been connecting with the community through art since 2014. Because of COVID-19, their work has shifted to the virtual realm. Join us, joining us now to discuss our co-founders of the BX Art Factory, Yolanda Rodriguez and Laura Alvarez. Thank you so much for joining us today, ladies. Hello. Hi. So first, I just want to learn, you know, for those folks that may not be familiar, just about the BX Arts Factory and your mission. Okay, so um, BX Arts Factory, our mission is to have art be accessible to everybody in the Bronx. And we do that by uh, creating programming that um, builds relationship between artists in our community and community members and neighbors. Um, and we have been around since 2014 and very grassroots organization. We started it with two community members and two artists getting together and trying to do something for our community. That's wonderful. So back in May, um, Yolanda, um, BX Arts Factory lost the physical space. As we saw on Instagram, you posted a video where you were packing and compacting all your stuff and transitioning your physical work to a new virtual space. Um, how has it been going? How has COVID-19 affected your work since then? Um, so having a space was definitely a, a blessing for us. Um, as you know, we didn't have a space before that. And we received this wonderful gift from Spaceworks uh, to be there. We were there for a year and a half. And we were uh, very active. We, we did so many programs uh, there. We have to pause on our programming to be able to regroup and figure out our next steps. But we haven't stopped. We have created some online virtual programs. Um, and we are, we're happy to be able to do that for yeah. our community, our followers. Laura, maybe you can chime in. Um, I know that the BXAF has established new programs to share art and joy while continuing your connection with the community. Can you tell us about virtual online programming like the Creative Corner and more and how people can tune in? Yes, so we were trying to do activities that are easy and that everybody can do it, even if you only have like a pen and a pencil or in a paper. Uh, you can recycle paper too. And uh, um, Rudy Mejia, he's been doing like more like drawing style kind of classes and I've been doing more collage kind of uh, using just an old magazine and scissors and glue. So yeah, we're, we're trying to, we understand that it's hard time. So we don't want to go to the art store and buy a bunch of supplies with money that we don't have. So we wanted to keep creative and just use whatever we have home. We had, before that, we had the prompt. So every day we had a different word that would inspire you to create something. Also very easy with whatever you had. And that's what we've been doing so far. And also working with BronxNet to um, do more elaborate work, but that will come. Yeah. And for now, how can people tune into those, um, those shows, those, those events that you're posting and the programming that you're posting with Creative Corner? We have a YouTube page. If you go to our website and you go to the bottom of the uh, website, it's bxrsfactory.org, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and all the other social media. And that's the easiest way to get the links to all our social media. And we post it in um, the other places, but YouTube is the way we publish it. So if you subscribe, you get a notification every time we, Mondays and Wednesdays, we do the videos. Thank you for sharing that, Laura. You know, art is so therapeutic, especially around these times. I'm not an artist myself. I can't draw for the life of me. But Don't say that. Everybody's an artist. <laughs> Everybody's an artist. <laughs> it's, it's in us, right? So I, I'm yes. really grateful for BXAF for opening this virtual platform for us to kind of escape um, the convulsions of life at this time and like really be at peace. Um, through art. So thank you for, for still working through through this virtual realm. Um, I also wanted to ask you both, um, with the BX Arts Factory being operated by Black and Brown members, can we discuss the importance of artist solidarity and the impact of protests and civil unrest um, that they've had in, in the nation and here in the Bronx as well? Great question. Um, we actually have been heavily talking about this uh, among ourselves uh, in our board meetings and meetings with our advisory committee members. We, um, we are not like other organizations. We definitely had to take a break, right? We, we may have been, um, we were very impacted, basically. Um, our people, the people that are with us in our organization, we have been heavily impacted emotionally and mentally by everything that's happening. This is not something that's new for any of us. This is something that we have experienced our entire lives for many of us. So 
having um, all these protests come out have been, it's been great, great to see that, but it's also been heavy uh, to see, you know, the, the death of George Floyd and, and other, and Breonna and all these, all these people that have recently been in the, in the spotlight. Um, we had to sit down, we had to really um, talk about how we felt and work through our own feelings. Um, recently, for example, we had a, an event called Are You Okay? where in that event we invited our, our fellow artists and, and members of our organization to join in in an open forum conversation. We were joined by an artist, uh, an art therapist as well. So we had the time to uh, center ourselves and, and really meditate and, and try to find that joy that's going to help us go through, right? Because with all this pain, at times we forget that we need, we need to take care of ourselves and we need to find joy so we can continue the fight. And that has been kind of like the way we have tried to support our members and, and the board and everybody um, in the days that, yeah, in, on the, under all the circumstances, everything that's going on. Right, and thank you for the reminder, Yolanda. You know, at the end of the day, um, it is a grassroots-led effort and you are the people of the Bronx, so you are right here with us in this battle and this um, civil unrest in our community. Mm -hmm. As well, so thank you for sharing. Um, I also wanted to bring on another, uh, maybe a little lighthearted news um, when it comes to art and the BX Arts Factory. Um, BronxNet was also lucky to catch Laura volunteering to beautify community bridges in the community through an incredible initiative fighting food insecurity here in the borough. Laura, can you please tell us about using your art to join this initiative? Sure. Um, so it was, you know, we do a lot of things and a lot of people knows us. So somehow someone reached out to somebody that knew somebody that is in, <laughs> in the organization. <laughs> they were, that's what, how it happens. <laughs> and they were really concerned because the fridge they got, they, they got a fridge that was white and you know it was kind of fine but then it broke they got another one it was black and with the background of the place that it, it was, you couldn't see it so they were concerned and they did they weren't sure what to do maybe paint it i'm like i'll do it don't worry people is gonna see it after i'm done with it <laughs> and that's how it started because i think it's such a great initiative you you really never know how many people is not having enough money to buy food and keep a roof over their heads and play, pay all the bills and just leave. So I thought it was amazing. And then after the first fridge that I painted, I painted a second one, a third one, and I'm painting another one this week. So hopefully we keep getting more of those and, and we can make more noise and people know about it. And, and thanks to having all those articles going on in press and it's been like in the CBS news and all that stuff, there's been a lot of donations getting to those fridges. So that's what we wanted. We wanted to make an impact. We wanted to not have food go to waste because there's a lot of food that it goes to waste every day. So by having this network of people that are working together, they can go pick up the food. They, they distribute it in the, between the fridges. I, it's a lot of work that it takes to keep those fridges up though. Right. I, I just went and painted them, but like there are people like, really taking care of their, those fridges and taking care of their community, stacking the fridges twice a day and they go empty. So right. that's how you, yeah, how you know how many people need the food. And, and most of the times they fill it up with fresh fruit, like fresh fruits and vegetables, produce that is not that easy to get in those places because either are very expensive or they're not that good quality. So they have a lot of connections with community gardens and other places they, they can donate that kind of food. Right. For our viewers, I just want to um, give the, the Instagram page is at IOHNYC for you to see the list of community fridges around the, the Bronx. Um, they are growing, as Laura said, they're popping yeah. up everywhere and it's all volunteer based. So mm -hmm. I'm just glad that you were able to, to beautify them. They look, they look gorgeous. They look amazing. <laughs> just pop of color for everyone that passes by and sees it. And it's also a spring of joy for people to know that the community is there for them, you know, and mm -hmm. every just volunteer just how you're volunteering to paint them they're volunteering to to keep them up going as well um just to speak about um the Bron the bx arts factory covid 19 response fund and for artists and the challenges that artists and freelancers face due to social distancing and limited work if yolanda or laura can answer that 
Yeah, so yeah, Yolanda you started a, yeah. an initiative and um, basically we were asking for money if people, we, we know that there's a lot of people struggling, but we know that there's a lot of people that they still have the means to help other people. So Yolanda started an initiative to get those funds and to help out most of the artists that we work with. They have no jobs right now. And Yolanda can tell you more about it because we've been sending them money. Yeah. Yeah, so we have, uh, so far our campaign was a, has been able to support eight artists with a grant of $250. Um, our goal is to support way more artists, so we do need people to go to our page. Um, as soon as they go into our website, they see the emergency uh, response click uh, to click for donation there. Um, because, you know, we, we are going, as, as we gather donations, we're able to grant relief funds to artists, right? So that's how we're doing it. And um, we are trying to focus on artists that have worked with us or that are connected somehow to, to our organization. We know there's a lot of need out there, but we immediately noticed that the artists that we have worked with, which are hundreds of artists and volunteers were, were losing their jobs. They were um, like, you know, we know uh, of a couple that's expecting their first baby and they needed support, right? There's just so many stories like that. We have other artists that, or members um, of people that we know that are um, undocumented immigrants that are not receiving any support from the city or government. So there's a lot of artists and people in our community in, under those circumstances. So we definitely wanted to make sure that we have something to support them. And again, we encourage people to help us out. Um, there's still many artists in the waiting list if, the, if you're an artist in the Bronx that have, are, is connected to organization, somebody that have volunteered with us, they're um, free to apply to receive the funds as well. And um, both links are in our website for people to apply to receive the funds, but also to donate, which is something that we definitely need more um, so we can get to our goal of $9,000 to be able to support more artists. Right, and thank you. The website is bxartsfactory.org, right? We're going to put Correct. that yeah. right below. Um, thank yeah. you both, Yolanda and Laura, for joining us today. And thank you for continuing, um, you know, the virtual arts showcasing and programming and connecting with the community through this difficult yes. time. Thank, thank you. you. We have something exciting coming with BronxNet, but we're not going to announce it yet. But uh, <laughs> just watch out. Keep it. Yes. We, we love BronxNet and we love working with you guys. So thank you for inviting us. We love you too. Thank you. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Folks, um, please stay connected with BX Arts Factory and tune into their programs like The Creative Corner by following at BX Arts Factory on social media and bxartsfactory.org. OpenBXRX will be right back. Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. Coronavirus spreading, people at higher risk must take extra precautions. You're at higher risk if you're over 65 or if you have an underlying medical condition. Please visit coronavirus.gov for more information.
Welcome back to OpenBXRX. While cultural institutions, including libraries, are not included in the phase four reopening here in New York City, many educational resources are still being made available online. The Schomburg Center is one of the world's leading cultural institutions devoted to preserving and exhibiting African-American history. Joining us now to discuss and share more is Kevin Young, director of the Schomburg Center. Kevin, thank you so much for making the time to join us today. Thanks for having me. As we know, the Schomburg Center is an iconic cultural institution. It's been around for 95 years. But for those who may not be familiar, can you just give us a little bit about the mission statement? Yeah, we're the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. We've been based in Harlem since uh, 1925. And um, we've always been part of the New York Public Library. We started as the Negro Division of the New York Public Library for history, literature, and prints. Uh, and we, the next year, in 1926, uh, we received, uh, through the generosity of a grant and a purchasing of Arturo Schomburg's collection. Arturo Alfonso Schomburg uh, is our founder in that way. His collection of 10,000 items uh, gathered from around the world really formed the basis of the collection. And Arturo Schomburg was born in Puerto Rico. He's Afro-Latinx. Um, and we, we, we very much honor that heritage. Um, and when he was a child in Puerto Rico, someone told him there was no black history. So he said about a teacher, uh, sad to say. So he said about proving that teacher wrong, which he did easily. And just on a person working in a mailroom salary, he gathered this amazing collection which he sold to the New York Public Library of 10,000 items. We now have 11 million items, and we've been named a National Historic Landmark in 2017. Um, and we've just been going strong since then, co collecting and providing access to work from around the world about global Black culture. Thank you for that, Kevin. Um, we may not be able to physically gather at the Langston Hughes Auditorium, for instance. However, important discussions are still happening virtually. But how have operations and plans changed at the Schomburg Center due to COVID-19? Well, we're not open to the public, but we're still having uh, events, both online and uh, we have our old events and programs that we've we've been doing for 95 years and, you know, obviously not videotaping that whole time. But um, very recently, you can go, uh, especially via Instagram or Twitter or find us on Facebook, and you can live stream material, you can uh, check out clips. Uh, you can see basically what we've been up to recently, especially, and we have current events going on. We have uh, an event with Isabel Wilkerson, the wonderful writer and Pulitzer Prize winner, her new book, Cast, uh, which is going to think about class, uh, is coming out. And uh, the wonderful book she wrote, The Warmth of Other Suns, about the Great Migration, which of course is what changed Harlem and may brought us into existence. So um, I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. Uh, and people can really find us in lots of different ways. Um, I also wanted to share um, some of the over, you have like over 10 beautiful, easy to navigate digital Schomburg's online exhibitions. Um, yeah. Such as the Black New Yorkers and Black Power, the movement, the legacy. I was looking through it. We have a few um, screen recordings that we want to share with our viewers. Um, oh, but please can you tell me a little bit about the exhibitions that are available now for viewing? Well, uh, for instance, one of my favorites, a favorite's the wrong word because it's just so powerful and moving, is the one on Emmett Till. The Emmett Till project is really haunting, and I think it tells us a lot about now, but you have scholars writing about Emmett Till, who died, of course, in, and was lynched in 1955, and who jump-started, in many ways, the modern civil rights movement, and this uh, current moment is an extension of that. Uh, we just lost John Lewis, um, uh, as you know, and C.T. Vivian, the wonderful uh, civil rights figures, and I had met both of them um, in my time in Atlanta. And so to know that uh, they're not with us, but to know also that there's this long legacy is really important. And I think things like the digital exhibition, the Emmett Till, the Black Power, they all tell you about where we've been uh, and help us think about where we're going, but also where we are now. Yes, and just to elaborate on that, it's always relevant and necessary to learn Black history and Black culture, but can we talk about the power of understanding and retracing the past now, especially during times of national civil unrest and movements happening nationally and here in the Bronx and Harlem as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we were hard hit uh, and still are by COVID and um, our neighborhoods, our boroughs, you know, we, we face this in two different pandemics. You know, we have the pandemic, uh, of course, of coronavirus, but also um, the horrible pandemic of racism. And, and these uh, 
documents, uh, the things we've collected, the exhibitions we put on, the programs we host, these are all ways of trying to understand our moment, but also through the past. I think it's one of the wonderful things about the Schomburg Center is when you come see us online, um, you know, you have that full context that nearly 100 year history to understand. And it's one reason we put together, for instance, the Black Liberation Reading List, which we can talk more about. Yes, that was the next question. Um, I just wanted to bring <laughs> well, that up. I guess, that was wonderful. <laughs> um, so on the Black Liberation Reading List for both youth and adults and the Black Bookstore Research Guide and you know other resources that you have as yes. well, African diaspora periodic periodicals, there's so many resources, a wealth of resources that people can take advantage of right now. Yeah, our librarians, our archivists, our booksellers, they've been busy. And you know, one of the things we did is we created the Black Liberation Reading List. Uh, it's 95 books for our 95 years. Um, and that's the first list we released. And it, it really goes everything from poetry to nonfiction. You'll find some classics like James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. And then you also find Jessamine Ward's book, which he edited called The Fire This Time, which is younger writers. I happen to be in that book, but thinking about the current moment. And it was a few years ago now. And so in a way it's really prescient talking about where we are now. Um, and what I love about that list is it does include all these other genres. There's something for everyone. And so after that, for Juneteenth, we released the youth uh, version of that for young readers. And that's really been wonderful to see uh, these books that, you know, it's 65 books that think about um, all ages of young people, you know, from picture books, uh, wonderful books about the green book, uh, which we have the biggest collection of green books in the world. Um, and also thinks about, you know, how you can talk about black power with your kids, um, but also has pleasurable books. Uh, and I think the, the thing that we want to help people see is, is themselves, you know, and see up close what black liberation looks like, which isn't just one thing. Um, so that's why we included history, but also poetry and art and music and even food, uh, ways, books that think about the whole of ourselves, which I think is very important in a time like now. Right. And um, Kevin, you also have a book in there. Brown is your book. Oh, can you just uh, yeah, I, I promise I didn't put it in there. <laughs> oh, it's not in there. Wait a minute. I think you spoke about it. I wanted no, to no, I, it's in there, but I didn't, wasn't the one who did it. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want people to think I want to create the whole list for my one book. But, That's you know, right. uh, that was my latest book of poems, which is a book about growing up in Kansas in part. And um, Linda Brown or Brown v. Board, the case that at least started the desegregation of the country, uh, went to my church and played piano. And so for me, it was a way of writing about her, writing about lots of Browns, James Brown being Brown, um, you know, John Brown even makes his way in there. But I also was thinking about uh, that important case and that important rever reverberation across history. There's poems about Harlem. It's really, um, uh, kind of an overview of, of thinking. And you know, there's a poem for Sandra Bland and poems for Trayvon Martin. It really is a book that when I was writing it, I was thinking a lot about these older figures. Uh, some of my heroes like Hank Aaron, uh, the Home Run King, or um, you know, uh, someone like James Brown. Um, but then I really started writing about my son who was a young person then, uh, a few years ago. And just really thinking about the danger he might be in in this moment you know, um, uh, police violence, which we've only seen more of lately. And so the book really is thinking about this layered uh, idea of my growing up in Kansas uh, and his growing up now in Atlanta and then up north. Wow, whoever decided to put the book in there, thank you. <laughs> thank you to your team. <laughs> thank you, I thank them too, yeah. And thank you for sharing. Um, speaking of youth, um, I just wanna tie this in. Um, on the Schomburg Center Junior Scholars Program, I know they were working mm. before COVID-19 and sure. the pandemic hit, a lot of things changed for them. Can you just tell me a little bit about the program? Yeah, it's been going about 18 years now. Uh, it's really a signature program of the Schomburg Center, Junior Scholars. Um, and we bring about 100 kids together, and they used to gather once a week in person in the Schomburg Center itself. And it's just a great opportunity for once a week on Saturday for them to meet um, and to connect and connect with each other, but also connect with our vast collections. Since COVID, um, they've been really wonderfully meeting uh, on their own virtually and created and continue that community. And so we're definitely continuing Junior Scholars this fall. It'll look a little different, I think, um, just because we're not having people in the building. Um, but I 
community really translates. And they just finished their uh, final project. So if you go to Schomburg.org or Schomburg Education, you can find uh, some of their on their recent projects. Thank you so much, Kevin. And before we go, um, just how folks can stay connected with the Schomburg Center and also access all the wonderful things you have and a message from the, to the community from the Schomburg Center. Yeah, to connect with the Schomburg Center, you can do it lots of ways. You can go online. Uh, you know, I go on Instagram a lot or Twitter at Schomburg Center is our handle there. Or you can just go to Schomburg.org or the new website, uh, SchomburgEducation.com features some about the junior scholars. So that's, there's a lot of links there. Um, you can get to our digital exhibitions and really the point is we want to create a home uh, for everyone you know we're part of the New York Public Library which extends into the Bronx of course and we think of ourselves as neighbors um, and a neighborhood that contains you know a nation indeed many nations and so please think of us as another home for you and please come online and when we reopen please come in person we have some of the best dance parties around uh you know um and so we would love to really see people and support them and you know, reach out let us know if there's a book you're reading uh something you're connecting and all those books by the way on the schomburg 95 and on the young readers most all of them you can check out for free with a New York Public Library card on our Simply e-reader. And right now we also are, through our branches, delivering books, uh, or rather having grab and go of books. So you can come through and pick up books in your neighborhood. Um, please do that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin, for your time today. Hey, thanks. Of course. So folks, again, you can stay connected by following at Schomburg Center on all social media. And for educational resources, archives, and more, visit schomburg.org. OpenBXRX will be right back. COVID-19 has spread rapidly throughout the world, leaving scientists scrambling to find a cure. Well, save the drama for the llamas, because they just might have the answer. Scientists throughout the U.S. and the United Kingdom are testing llamas to see how effective they are at treating COVID-19. They make the same kinds of antibodies we do, but in addition, they make this interesting kind of antibody, <clears throat> which is much smaller. And because it's so much smaller, it has some potential therapeutic advantages. Members of the camelid or camel family, llamas, alpacas, guanacos, and vicuñas produce smaller antibodies, or nanobodies which create an immune-boosting therapy for COVID-19. Dr. Mike Tibbet studies the effects of llama antibodies on the coronavirus and co-owns the Cloverbrook Farm along with his wife, Andrea Tibbetts, where they care for llamas and alpacas. In order for COVID-19 to infect the human body, a COVID-19 spike protein must bind to a specific protein on the surface of a human cell. According to Tibbetts, the llama nanobodies can be used as therapeutic agents to block the interaction between the COVID-19 protein and the surface of human cells. So just like all other kinds of antibodies, you can make antibodies that are really, really, really specific to a, to a protein. And in llamas, then you recover some of the serum and you can use that serum as a therapeutic. With the need for a cure worldwide, these llama nanobodies also have the potential to be produced on a larger scale. You can make tons and tons of this really tiny antibody that has those advantages that I said before, right? It's small, it can get into small spaces. While Andrea Tibbetts does not plan on testing the llamas and alpacas at the Cloverbrook farm, she believes that llamas in general have a docile nature, which makes them an easy partner for research. For research, Llamas are very handleable, they're very docile, and so I would assume for any type of handling for, for scientific uh, experiments that's probably frequent, they're an easier animal to handle. While the production of this possible cure can take years to create, there is still hope that a cure for a virus that has killed millions of people worldwide can be found with these adorable fuzzy animals. Reporting for BronxNet, Jericho Tran. Welcome back to Open BXRX. The Black Professional's Guide, How to Navigate White Privilege in the Workplace is a new book by S.J. Brown. Joining us now today to discuss this book is author S.J. Brown. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. She is no stranger to the show. She's been here before just for full disclosure, but now she's under her pseudo name, the author name. So I'm really excited. And, you know, congratulations mm -hmm. on the release of your book. Thank um, you. To start off, just for our viewers, can you tell us about your book, um, How to Navigate White Privilege in the Workplace, and the inspiration behind it? Okay, well, the book is exactly that. It's not necessarily um, for the Black professional, 
but it's from my perspective. And me being a Black professional, I had to write from my voice. And part of the inspiration for the book was, number one, I had a child that was entering corporate America. And number two, I've had so many negative interactions that I felt like people who aren't exposed to corporate, they need a framework, they need a reference, they need a guide. So it was an experience at one of my former employers that kind of catapulted everything and made me sit down and say, hey, I need to write this book. And full disclosure, I wrote that book on my iPhone. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's a year in the making, right? I it's think a year in the making. Yep. Yep. I started last year in May because of a particular incident. And it was a phrase that one of my coworkers always used, and it was stay out of the way. Oh. And that is something that I've heard time and time again, even in school, even in the workplace, you need to learn how to stay out of the way. And I, it bothered me. So I wanted to expound on it. And the way for me to expound on it was to take the experiences of not just people of color, but just white people too, because Part of the reason why I want the book to be read is because they need to understand where we're coming from and they need to understand how they're perceived by people like us. So right. I, I definitely wanted to bring that up, that this book is also um, a learning experience for a white person in a position of power. So it's not Absolutely. just for a person to learn how to navigate um, a white privilege in, in a workplace, but also for that person probably giving that, 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 um, that vibe or that experience to their employee. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's one thing for people to say, oh, well, I'm not racist, but the microaggressions come off as racist. And you need to understand what microaggressions look like to us. So yeah. even if it is the Black Professionals Guide, my voice, it's for anyone who works at a clothing store, who works at a hospital, who works, hell, even if you work at a grocery store, it's for you. Right. And um, SJ, I got to speak to you, like, you know, with the author name, um, about your <laughs> personal experience, um, you know, growing up and going into the corporate world, you were in the corporate world for 22 years. Um, how have your experiences kind of shaped um, the way that you wrote this book? Well, for one thing, it made me be honest about my own shortcomings. And it made me be honest about other people's shortcomings who've had bad experiences. The book is not written just from my perspective. I interviewed a ton of people and I put those interviews in chapters, kind of like by situation. And I made it fit for those chapters. I didn't embellish. I kept people's voices, changed their names, but I had to be honest about what my shortcomings were. And I had to be honest about how I could have did things differently. So that's what kind of helped me lay the foundation for the book. But I also had to hold the corporations accountable for the people who were having bad experiences. How did they feel? How, did, how could they have done things better? So it opens up a discussion, believe me. It's, it's appropriate for a book club. It's appropriate for an orientation. It is appropriate for anyone who has to navigate the corporate business world. Right, and I mean, maybe within one of those testimonies, we can relate to someone, Absolutely. you know, all of them really, because we've all had experiences in workplaces that made us feel a little uncomfortable. And like Absolutely. You said, the, the answer was always, you know, stay out of the way, which is, I mean, is that a threat? Like what? <laughs> but <laughs> I also wanted to pick your brain a little bit about this whole Nick Hanna situation with Viacom. You know, that's, that's gone, it's exploded and that's kind yes, of- Yes, it has. It, it's kind of like related to what the book uh, touches upon. Can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts behind that? Part of my thoughts behind that is, is that people of color, especially as the hues get darker, we are never given the benefit of doubt. We are never given the benefit of the doubt. It would have been nice if Viacom could have sat down with Nick and said, Nick, what did you mean by these comments? What is your perspective? They should have had some type of meeting of the minds to see how can we both grow from this? Nick has taken the responsibility. He's reached out to Jewish leaders to kind of get more of a perspective, but I don't think in any way that he meant that as a racist statement. We know that when people don't understand us, they react to us violently. They react to us hostilely. They react to us defensively. So for him stating that they didn't understand us, so that's why they tried to control and tried to conquer us, 
I don't think that was a bad statement. We've seen it historically. And again, as someone who loves Wildin' Out, who appreciates Nick Cannon and his growth from, um, from, I think he started off on Nickelodeon, as a matter of fact. Yep. His evolution has been phenomenal, and he's done a lot for the culture. He's done a lot for people. So they should have taken that into consideration, and they should have sat down, and they should have talked to him. They should have given him the benefit of the doubt, and we don't have that luxury off. I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with that. Um, we're also seeing um, Nick Cannon in this battle to, like, get his show back. You know, like, he's the right. one that's out with right. the show, and they're kind of just, like, taking it from him and not, you know... Right. Um, but I also wanted to speak about, um, you know, we've seen it time and time again through the Black Lives Matter movement, how big corporate companies are quick to back the movement, but they have terrible track records with their Black employees and employees of color. What are some steps that employees um, can take to, one, call out unfair corporate practices, and two, hold their employer accountable if there's ev ever any fair, unfair um, treatment? The one thing that people need to stop doing is reacting off of emotion because the one thing that we say in the medical world is if it's not documented it's not done they need to start documenting these instances and not by emotion they also have to read their company policy and procedure manuals there is so much verbiage in those manuals and sometimes it's twisted to fit situations you have vague infractions like conduct unbecoming of a professional so I think a lot of times people need to reflect and say, okay, wait a minute, am I acting off of emotion or is this something concrete that actually happened that I can quantify? We know racism exists, but we can't call every situation racist, even though we know it is, the hairs on the back of our knuckles stand up. We'll get this like feeling in the pit of our stomach, but they don't understand that because again, they've never walked in our shoes. So we have to document instances, not emotions. And the other way they can hold corporations accountable is by following the steps to the chain of command. If they have union representatives, they need to start speaking to their union representatives. They also need to hold diversity and inclusion accountable. A lot of times companies have diversity and inclusion departments, but they work for the company. Mm. They're not necessarily working for us. They're looking out for the best interests of the company. We need to hold those corporate officers because they are corporate officers we need to hold them accountable if you're here for the people then represent the people mm -hmm. they also have you know different um different national services too that you can start reporting these infractions to and you have to be able to have those outlets you have to be able to have those guys i list a whole wealth of resources and contacts in the back of my book so that people will know who they can contact for what reason this includes my LGBTQ community. This includes whether you're Asian, whether you're a person, um, a brown person, a black person. We are people of color. We are a marginalized community. We need to start documenting these infractions. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing the resources in your book as well. Going back to your book, as stated on your website, you use your unique voice and humor to navigate this tough topic. Um, can we get a little sneak peek of one of the experiences you share within the book? And then please tell us why it's important for you as an author to break the ice using humor. Well, I'm going to start with the last part of the question first. Part of the reason why people use humor to diffuse tough situations when it comes to topics of color is because of white fragility. It's, if you walk into a situation like a Clydesdale stumping on everything, it's going to automatically shut people down. They're not going to want to hear what you have to say. So sometimes you have to break the ice with humor. That's not to say that the topics are taken lightly, but that's just to say it gives levity to a, a grave situation because this, this, is, this is real. So in order to get people to receive what you're saying, you have to break the ice. And one way I break the ice is by my sense of humor. Mm -hmm. So one of the topics that I talk about in the book or one of the situations that I talk about in the book is profiling names. And there is no way, if you are an ethnic person, you can get around that. We've mm -hmm. become creative with our names. We have ethnic names. And the one thing that I tell people is, is that you have a right to your name. I, I was a big Wire watcher, The Wire. And I remember at the end of that series, Marlo Stansfield, he said, my name is my name. And it, 
identifies us as being a unique people. We don't want to be homogenous. We want to we want to look like the rainbow colors of the world. So we get that through our name. And I talk about how there was one particular person I interviewed who couldn't get a job at a particular employer and she kept applying and she kept applying and she kept applying. And then finally I told her, I said, use your first initial, your middle name and your last name. Mm -hmm. And I promise you within two weeks, she has six interviews. Wow. And, and you can't prove that they were name profiling, but you can prove it. You see what I'm saying? Right. They'll say back to us, well, you got the job now. So how can you prove that? So that's what I mean about documenting instances, because if she had never gotten that job, then we might have a fight. But now they can say, oh, but we gave you the job, but you didn't give me the job based upon my first name. I had to get creative because of your constraints. Right. So I talk about name profiling, definitely. And, and not good. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that we as a people, people of color, we make it our business to learn how to pronounce people's names. They never take the time to pronounce our names. They always want to give us a cute pseudonym or a cute nickname. And I tell people in the book, make them learn how to pronounce your name. It identifies you as a unique individual. So make them learn how to pronounce your name. If you have a nickname because you have 13 consonants in your name, then so be it. But make them learn how to pronounce your name. Say it and preach it. Thank you so much for your time today. As <laughs> Brown, um, thank you for the sneak peek into the book um, with that, you know, the experience with the names. That's something that a lot. Oh, there she go. There's the book. <laughs> we'll make sure to show it on screen as well. The book okay. and people can purchase it. But thank you so much again. Um, how can people get in touch with you, learn more and purchase your book as well now that we're on that topic? Okay. So I have a landing page. It's called Chandra'sPlace.com. And that's where you can purchase the book directly from me. Within the next two weeks, it'll be released on Amazon. If you want to go on Amazon to purchase it from Amazon. And also, I am on Instagram as Chandra underscore the writer. And I'm also on Instagram under a nurse's column that I have. It's called the Black Nurses Corner. I'm on Facebook as my whole name, which is Chandra J. Brown. So if you want to find me, you can find me. I'm not hiding. You can find me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chandra, again. And shout out to the Black Nurses Corner. We love y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonny. <laughs> Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> again, folks, to purchase How to Navigate White Privilege in the Workplace, visit Chandra'sPlace.com, and you can follow the author at Chandra underscore the underscore writer on Instagram. That's all for our show today. Thank you for tuning in to BXRX. I'm your host, Sanjay Lopez, wishing you and your family safety and wellness now now and always. Until next time.